thank you for um, joining us and making time for this and for the incredible reflections that you shared through your essays. They're, they're really such important, beautiful works. And I hope that everyone in attendance will be able to read them in full if they haven't already. Um, to start, I'd love to invite each of you, as I said, to read an excerpt um, from your piece. And then we'll move into a discussion um, a little about your work. And then we'll also invite audiences in afterwards to join us in some breakout groups to go a little deeper in small group discussions about, about some of the issues that, that came out of your essays. Um, I'd like to start with Leela Ray Gillian, um, whose piece is called From Where and When I Enter, A Southern Black Femme Reckoning. And as a means of introduction, um, Leela is a New Orleans-based interdisciplinary artist and independent curator whose work is grounded in her devotion to Black mysticism and photographic investigation of intersectional identity. Guillory inherited rituals of hair maintenance, oral mythologies, and alternative photographic practices serving as the foundational elements of her work. Guillory's multifaceted art Art making process is incited by Louisiana's religious history of European, indigenous, and Afro diasporic spiritual syncretization. Her interdisciplinary practice follows the tradition of art as ritual, with past works offering divination to the Mississippi River watershed, ancestral veneration via self portraiture, immersive photo based installations, and spirit led photography. Welcome. Leela, and I invite you to um, introduce yourself and uh, read an excerpt from your piece. Thank you, Clint, um, and hi, everyone. Um, I'm Leela. I'm really, really excited to be participating in this, um, this event. Um, I'm going to share a few, um, a couple paragraphs from the introduction of my essay. Um, so here we go. So it says, um, Standing knee deep in murky water, I unravel the tail end of my braid to welcome the water's embrace. I mark my presence with a deep sigh, then inhale the musty scent of the Mississippi River. My breath is stolen by the distant melody of a song I can't quite discern from the gawking of a pelican loitering near my abandoned sandals. A reverb of metallic whistles strikes my ears, disrupting the rhythm of my breath and inspiring the bird to retreat into the smoke of the Louisiana sky. The sound grows closer and reveals itself as the steamboat natches. The song Lady Marmalade by the LaBelles emerges from the balcony of the boat. The song is quickly drowned by the chants of white tourists who have now spotted me in my lonesome. I unsuccessfully revert back to my intentional breathing and make the inevitable decision to part ways with the river. As I trek back to the shoreline and begin my journey up the Ninth Ward levee, I am met by a sea of white bodies with camera phones recording the New Orleans city landscape. The white tourists of the boat greet greet those on the shore and a ping pong match of who that begins. As I wring out the vestige of the Mississippi from my hair, a white lady from the group approaches me singing her pitchy rendition of Lady Marmalade. She takes one look at me and says, you're beautiful, wait there, I wanna take this photo. I ignore her presence, continuing to rebraid my damp hair while she simultaneously pulls out her phone to capture non-consensual photos of me. She asks, is that all your hair? It is the irony of this entire moment that rebirths the question I have yet to answer, from where and when do I enter? Growing up, I quickly recognized the nomadic nature of the women in my family, a byproduct of economic displacement and a strong desire to become women of their own making. The intersections of white supremacy and pa patriarchy would prevent them from fulfilling this desire, but their search for self-expression birthed meaningful stories of triumph and self-determination. These women were storytellers and truly this is how our family survived. It was not long before I inherited their skills of survival along with a deep desire to be a woman of my own making. I made photographs of them, memorializing their every word, both fact and fiction, but explained to me all I would need to live and all I would need to die. However, they never warned me of a professional world that had no interest in hearing my story, but would tell me who I was. Here we are. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Leela. There's certainly a lot to dive into there. I also want to point out that in the medium post that we have, um, there are several of Leela's photographs that I encourage you to check out because they make a nice, um, they offer a, a lot to, to the words as well. 
Um, next up, um, I'd like to invite Michelle Lanier to read a piece from her essay, which is entitled Waverly, Afro-Carolina. Um, and as a means of introduction to Michelle, she's an Afro-Carolina folklorist, oral historian, museum professional, filmmaker, and educator with over two decades of commitment to her callings. Raised in both Columbia and Hilton Head, South Carolina, and having ancestral roots in the Sand Hills, Coastal Plain, and Upper Piedmont of North Carolina, Michelle's ancestral geography guides much of her interdisciplinary work. As a seasoned public humanities professional, in 2018, Michelle was named as the first African-American director of all of North Carolina's 25 state-owned historic sites. In 2008, Michelle successfully advocated for legislation creating the North Carolina African-American Heritage Commission, which she led as its founding executive director. She's also served on the faculty of the Center for Documentary Studies at Duke University since 2000. This work has led Michelle's role as a documentary doula, um, aiding in the birth of films, most notably the award-winning Mossville, When Great Trees Fall, which reveals a global South story of resistance to environmental racism and which we showed at the New Orleans Film Society a couple years ago. Michelle has traveled to Panama and Ghana to document African diaspora folkways, her ethnographic her ethnographic work on funerary traditions of St. Helena Island in South Carolina led to her role as North Carolina's inaugural liaison to the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor, which she now serves as an appointed commissioner. Michelle, thank you so much for being here. And I cede the space over to you to, to read from your work. Thank you. And I've set a timer because I may go on just a little longer. Um, than Leela, but I want to say it's really important that I followed Leela because um, I hear in Leela's work an honoring of the ancestral realm. And I think it's really important to acknowledge and have a spirit of deference and a positionality of deference as daughters of the African diaspora to the ancestral realm. So I'm really um, grateful to follow Leela. So I'll read a bit. Waverly taught me many things. I learned to get off the phone during thunderstorms, kneel in prayer, and stretch my brown skin under hot ivory soap bubbles or Calgon salts. I learned to lotion elbows, knuckles, ankles, heels, and to grease my scalp. I learned to always keep a dollar or two handy and tucked. I was taught to wear slips and earrings and to dance and sing out the compression of a week while fish fried, records played, and grown folks sipped and gossiped and laughed. My heart was held in their laughter. What I mean to say is that their laughter, the laughter of Afro-Carolina grown folks, held my heart aloft. Like cooking pots nestled one inside the other, inside the other, inside the other, there were layers to the lessons. There was a cavalcade of teachers with literacies as varied as the flowers that dotted the neighborhood. It's an all black neighborhood, by the way. Dogwood, crepe myrtle, azalea, hydrangea, daffodil, camellia, tulips. One such teacher. I forget the name. We have some sound here. Coming in. One such teacher was Miss Jenny Collins, a Waverly ancestor who was serious about her roses, as serious as just about anything else on earth. Miss Collins was widowed twice by two black men in the practice of medicine, an obstetrician and a dentist. Neither marriage produced children and so her wealth was left to bloom under her shrewd care. Miss Collins wore real diamonds, real mink, and wore her hair in a silken silver bob like a grand dam of the flapper era. Her skin was the color of cinnamon poured on buttered and sugared toast. And for years, Miss Collins rented out the tiny cottage next door to her elegant home to drink small. Drink small, known for singing songs like Titty Man. I'm in love with a grandma. Widow woman, glory, hallelujah, and I really don't care. I want to go to the, toward the end of the piece. There were things that Waverly could not teach. 
but there were also things that we all knew. We knew that if you bothered the icy lady too many times, there would be no grape icy for you. And everybody knew that Mrs. Collins' tenant, late life tenant Roosevelt wasn't real, that he hadn't poured mink on her ink, nor had he scratched her Cadillac. But everyone did not know that on some late nights, a brown and tall boned soul might emerge sparked and spangled in red bugle beads, spiked Turner, Tina Turner wig pinned in place, face shimmering, heels in his hands, neat as his leather Peugeot seats. That equinox, he was startled too by the sight of me being dropped off from nearby Waverly. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, such poetry. Um, I could listen to you just speak on and on about this place. Um, and I do want to do have some questions about it that I want to get to after everyone's had a chance to to read. But um, I'd like to um, move on to Monique, um, who will read from her piece, which is entitled The South is Not Black and White. And to introduce Monique, uh, she is an interdisciplinary storyteller who documents the complex relationship between environment, culture, and climate in Southeast Louisiana. She's a citizen of Homa Nation, director of the Land, Memory Bank, and Seed Exchange, and a member of the Another Gulf is Possible Collaborative, working to envision just economies, vibrant communities, and sustainable ecologies. She is co-producer of the documentary, My Louisiana Love, and her work has been included in a variety of environmentally inspired projects, including the multi-platform performance, Cry You One, Unfathomable City, A New Orleans Atlas, and the collaborative book, Return to Yaknichito, Homa Migrations. Monique, I turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, I just wanna give gratitude um, to the world that um, we've been able to enter into through um, everyone's words that have been shared, so thanks. Um, the South I know best stretches from the bottomland hardwood forests to the marshes to the crystal quartz barrier islands found across the coastal territories of the Gulf of Mexico's northern rim, from Huma, Louisiana to Pensacola, Florida. I've been thinking a lot about all the stories that I don't know, discovering the meanings of names of places I've driven by hundreds of times, learning that these names, these places, Pascagoula, Biloxi, Mobile, are more than the names of places. They are the names of forgotten peoples and of rivers that feed estuaries, connecting the lands and fresh waters to the sea. The older I get, the more I appreciate that I've been so blessed to be born, bred, and fed in spirit and body by the salt and fresh waters of these biodiverse in-between lands. The Mississippi River Delta is the place I call home. My wild garden grows on my grandmother's land just south of Bulbuncha sinking colonial city, New Orleans. Bulbuncha, place of many tongues or place of many languages, is the name the Shata, Shakta, called this lower Delta territory long before the French claimed and rebranded our sacred site of trade. It wasn't until the 300 year celebration of the colonial founding of the city of New Orleans back in 2018 that I first learned this word, Volbuncha, a name this place is still living up to. In 2019, before COVID-19 shut the world down, the city welcomed close to 20 million visitors, maybe too many visitors in my honest opinion, but the fact is evidence that this place has been and continues to be a meeting point where ideas and cultures and goods are exchanged and experienced. I, like most people of the United States Gulf Coast, am of mixed descent. My father's bloodlines are tied to the Homa Nation and the Chenier Ridges at the ends of the bayous and the Yaknishido the big country between the Atchafalaya and Mississippi rivers. 
My mother's ancestors were some of the first French colonizers who sailed into the swamp with the company of John Law back in the early 1700s. Other maternal ancestors immigrated from Saint-Domingue, Haiti at the turn of the century during the revolution. As I acknowledge the histories flowing through my DNA, a compli complicated melange of colonizer and colonized, I've been challenged to reassess my understanding of the complexities of place and peoples, forcing me to recognize how relations to past and present intersect with future potentials and prayers. The South is in the process of healing from the scars of silent stories and too many Southern narratives oversimplified to be boiled down to simple black and white dichotomies. Southern histories written by the hands of white supremacy have been bound within public school books to be cited as fact, allowing Hollywood to perpetuate antebellum fantasies, civil war, revelry, reconstructions, reckoning, and the reigns of terror muting memories, erasing truth, and reimagining traditions. The South, especially the United States Gulf South, is not a black and white story. It's technicolor reflecting off a crystal, making rainbows that shimmer in emerald green blue waves, bouncing light from sky to sea. Migration, resistance, liberation, solidarity, mixed identities, and survival are the themes embedded in the lived experience of Southern stories that continue to inspire me. Stories I wish were witnessed more in modern storytelling mediums. All rivers and oceans lead to Balbuncha and Gulf Coast ports, ports of call where migrations, fueled by curiosity and conquest, willed by desires for a better life or forced upon through enslavement, where ancestors of the South found a sense of refuge in the wetlands and on the high grounds, where the wildflowers grow for the sake of survival, destined to find a way, destination unknown. Thank you, Monique. Um, and our fourth, um, Writer is Adam Forrester, who will be reading from his essay, which is entitled Surprised to See You. Uh, Adam is an award-winning filmmaker and artist who was based in Atlanta, Georgia. His work has been featured by Oxford American Magazine, NPR, Aeon Magazine, and Vice Magazine, and exhibited at the Historic Center of Kalamata in Greece, Bunkier Stuki, Contemporary Art Gallery in Poland. I had to ask my Polish colleague how to say that. Uh, Weinberg Newton Gallery in Chicago, the Soap Factory in Minneapolis, White Speck in Atlanta, and the Atlanta Contemporary Art Center. His films have been distributed by PBS and screened at Doc NYC, IFF Boston, Sheffield Doc Fest, New Orleans Film Festival, Indie Grits, and many more. His work is held in the collections of the David N. Rubenstein Rare Book and Manuscript Library at Duke University, by Necky Rare Book and Manuscript Library at Yale, and the Museum of Contemporary Art in Georgia and Atlanta. Adam received an, M an MFA in studio art from the University of Georgia, and from time to time, he reminisces, reminisces about the moment when jelly shoes and Reebok <laughs> pumps were popular. Adam, I'll turn it over to you to read from your piece. Thank you, Clint. And I also want to express uh, gratitude. And uh, I'm just humbled to be in this room and space with you also. Really grateful to be here. Um, is my audio OK? If it, the box didn't highlight, it's OK. OK. Uh, oh, so just to set this piece up, this is me in New York at an after party that's happened before this scene. Across the room, I saw a man who seemed familiar. I was sure I'd seen him smoking a cigarette outside a bar in Atlanta. He was wearing a colorful scarf. Maybe it was red and a yellow beanie resting atop his forehead, pushing his salt and pepper hair back. He was perhaps the only person in the, old, in the whole place holding a brown bottle of beer. I walked up to him, held up my beverage and smiled. Cheers, I said. We clinked drinks. Cheers to you, he said. We began working our way past small talk. Turns out the familiarity was just his regionally specific quirks. 
He was from South Carolina. As we talked, it was becoming clear to me that this beer was not his first or second. His partner walked up midway through our conversation. Her eyes met mine and they seemed to say, I'm sorry, he's drunk. I smiled and shrugged my shoulders. We introduced ourselves. She complimented my red shoes and three of us slid back into small talk. After exchanging the standard, what's your project about questions, the man from South Carolina asked me if I was based here, meaning New York. No, no, I grew up in Alabama and I live in Atlanta now, I said. Oh, oh, he took a sip of his beer. Surprised to see you here. His partner leaned over and smacked him on the shoulder. What, he said. It was really nice to meet you, she said. She turned to him, let's go. You've had too many already. I smiled and waved as the pair trotted off to the food table. I stood there with the man's words echoing in my head. I was already feeling a little out of place and I was drawn to this fellow by some semblance of a kindred spirit. I expected the producer I spoke to who previously rejected my pitch to run for cover and she did so with grace. For most of the evening, I had felt like a stranger in a strange land, but what hurt most was this was that this fellow Southerner in New York didn't expect me to be there. I can't be certain about the nature of his astonishment for my presence, but I felt that he confirmed my own under, underlying suspicion that I didn't belong there at this party with real filmmakers who make real films that make real money. The sales agent from New York City didn't make me feel that way. The producer that rejected my pitch didn't make me feel that way. My contemporary filmmaker from South Carolina made me feel that way. As Southern filmmakers, we do this to ourselves and to one another. We sometimes believe wholeheartedly the outsider's narrative. People from this region, the American South, don't deserve to play in the same arena as the coastal elites. The notion that I'm somehow less than acceptable when it comes to filmmaking seems to run through my own mind on repeat. I've talked myself into that belief over and over. I grew up in a multifaceted family. We were a lower middle class Southern white family. I was a freckled faced boy who spent all his free time playing in the forest behind my childhood home. Sometimes I'd sleep over at my cousin's trailer, box fan in the window, Marlboro lights on the counter, hot dogs and a bag of Doritos on the kitchen table. Once while out of fa family gathering, a bee stung me. My uncle pitched, pinched some chewing tobacco from his dip can and taped it to my welted skin. It worked, it sucked the sting right out. A few years later, a different uncle became a professor with a PhD and taught American history. He'd tell me about his current teaching topics. He taught me how to play guitar and introduced me to the Beatles. On one side of my family, some of my cousins have gone to prison, while on the other side of my family, I have a cousin who was a highly sought after traveling veterinarian. I share this to provide an example of my own background and how its uniqueness prepared me to make the work that I'm currently making now. The 12 minute film I brought to New York dealt with poverty and addiction in rural Alabama. One of the main participants in the film had just been released from prison and was living in a trailer, much like the one that I remember hanging out in with my cousin. Many of us from this region have multifaceted backgrounds because people living in this region have always had to be a little more resourceful here. Southerners are familiar with coming together pooling our own resources and getting things done for ourselves because we have to. Thank you, Adam. And thanks to everybody. I'm just going to drop in, I know I've already done this, but I'm going to drop in this link again where you can find the essays in full. So for everyone out there, if you want to take note of that URL and check out um, the essays when you can, if you haven't already had a chance to. Um, I was, I don't know how many of you had a chance to listen to um, Bo McGuire's opening keynote yesterday morning, but I've been thinking a lot about what he had to say and sitting with some of the particularities of his, the way he shot his feature film Socks on Fire in rural Alabama and how, how he talked about not just the story itself, but the process of his, of his filmmaking 
and how it was informed by his southernness, by his Alabama grandmother and the women who raised him, by the community of artist support and hospitality that he had in his hometown, and, and further by the notion of, of holding contradictions while remaining whole or attempting to remaining whole, which he sees as something of, um, as A, being distinctly Southern and B, being something that greatly informed and continues to inform his artwork and the language of his filmmaking. So jumping off from, from this, I'd like to hear from each of you about the place and the community that raised you. And I know that some of you have you know, addressed this in your pieces, but um, we'd love to hear about the place you come from and how your relationship to that place inspires not just your storytelling, but your process, how it inspires your practice and perhaps even the aesthetic that you bring to your work. Um, Michelle, I know you speak a lot about your ancestral geography, so maybe maybe you'd like to start. Yeah, so I, I call myself an Afro-Carolinian. Um, I was raised in South Carolina, you know, or what I also like to call the Southern realm of Afro-Carolina. And I live in and birthed my only child in and have deep, deep ancestral roots in the Northern realm of Afro Carolina, also known as North Carolina. And so it's important for me to talk about it that way because I often feel that outside of the South, when people talk about what a Southerner is, I don't feel that blackness is often centered. And so I've been playing with language to talk about, well, what is Afro Carolina? It's also a transportable um, geography. So there, there's an outpost of Afro Carolina that's in New Haven, Connecticut. There are people in New Haven that are from all over the Carolinas that are black, including Thelonious Monk's aunt, uh, descendants. So I was raised um, in Columbia um, under the battle flag before it came down the first time before Bree Newsom brought it down the second time. I was also raised in Hilton Head, South Carolina, among Gullah people because my mother was an educator there. And then I would go to visit my father's side um, in Raleigh, um, where the oldest HBCU in the South is, Shaw University. And there's 11 HBCUs in um, North Carolina. So um, these are the spaces where I was raised and um, the, it, yeah, so it, how I look at the world it, it is through the lens of self-determination, creating oasis spaces through my work in the same ways that my elders created black oasis spaces in their homes, their kitchens, churches, schools, and businesses. Um, and an ability to listen and watch everyone as a necessity for physical, emotional, and spiritual safety. And that, that ability to watch as a necessity translates really well over into my work as a folklorist and documentary doula and maker. Thank you, Michelle. Anyone else want to speak to this um, notion of, you know, where you come from and how that has shaped your approach to your work, your aesthetic, your, your practice? Um, I can share her. I'm, uh, I'm actually on my, I think I was conceived like on the land I'm standing on right now. <laughs> um, and, I mean, not like exactly, but yeah, maybe like a couple hundred feet from. Um, so I am, um, I'm on the banks of the Bayou Terrebuff, uh, Terrebuff land of beef or bison really. Um, when the colonizers came in, uh, yeah, there were, there, this is one of the Southeastern most places where Buffalo would make their migration and we have remnant prairie here. Um, but when I was a girl getting ready to start public school, my mom uh, decided the World's Fair ended here uh, in the New Orleans World's Fair of 84 ended and I was starting kindergarten and we moved to Pensacola. And I was so mad, like a five-year-old, like really, really mad um, and very tied to my grandmother and my my father's, you know, whole my aunts, uh, aunts, aunts, uh, relatives and, you know, there was just a family unit that I was very tied to. So I was really upset about that. And always from a child long to like return home. And, you know, they would make fun of me because I would like have my suitcase and catch rides however I could. You know, there's jokes about me like getting in cars with spring breakers or my mom would fly me over in a cargo plane where at this little airport she worked at, you know, it was just like however I could get home, I was getting home. 
Um, but I, I was, you know, on Pensacola Beach, which is part of Santa Rosa Island, and this is before, you know, it was still very like old school, old Florida world. And with each hurricane, um, there was like new development and just like the regular folk moved out and, you know, multi-million dollar mansions kind of plopped in their place. So it's a very different place there. Um, and then as a, a, you know, I was like, I graduated high school, I was like, bye, I'm um, going back to the mud and the swamp and I've been home ever since. And I think that just the, you know, the way people talk, <laughs> the way people look, I mean, Pensacola Beach is very like white and my mom, and you know, like that whole world is just like very different from Louisiana and the culture and food and how people talk became something uh, I was very aware of, which I go places now and they're like, you don't sound like you're from Louisiana. I'm like, what do I need? Like a baby alligator? I watch a lot of TV, you know, like, <laughs> um, you know, like, you know, it's the same, it's similar with uh, Homa people, right? Like they're ex like what these expectations of, of like, oh, well, you don't, you know, where's your like, uh, buckskin outfit or something. And the reality is that like, we're, like the indigenous people here in the Delta are very different from the, again, like that Hollywood persona of, of what the indigenous American experience is known as. So, um, so yeah, and, and, and then also, you know, being here in the heart of the Delta where we're surrounded by petrochemicals and um, being in a beautiful place like a barrier island where you feel very far away from that, but recognizing the interconnections and specifically, you know, the Gulf of Mexico, which is um, a womb for the world. So, uh, so yeah, I think that's a home place for me too, those waters and the river. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to follow that because um, I think a lot of what you just shared or what's coming up for me is this kind of like nuance of specifically Louisiana identity which oftentimes gets conflated to a New Orleans and specifically a, um, like an urban New Orleans experience. Like that's kind of like the, the, the motif of like the Louisianian like person. Um, and so for me, like it's, it's a hard thing to kind of discuss around place because I feel like my people have always been um, super nomadic even though they pretty much stayed in a similar kind of regent, but you know, historically the um how the how that space or that physical, the geography of Louisiana has been, you know, um it's been defined differently and changed, you know, in, in very short amount of time, but also over a longer period of time. So, you know, I, when I go home, people still refer to the same place as something different. There's like old ways of, you know, explaining how to get somewhere. Um, and so that obviously like influences the way I understand place, but more importantly that um, in like the black Creole culture that I grew up in, um, you know, where I grew up around black people who um, were lighter skinned, but also didn't necessarily, or like not directly because colorism definitely was there, um, but there wasn't necessarily um, a desire to remove themselves from blackness. Um, and so what that did was um, it made us, it made for a very insular experience. Like what we understood as place was determined by family. So I had family in Oberlin, Louisiana. I had family in Opelousas. I had family in Lake Charles, Louisiana, which is where I was born. Um, but I never understood myself as being only from Lake Charles. I had a lot of uncles who, you know, who grew up and built families in New Orleans and were a part of like, you know, the culture here. So I, I didn't have this kind of disconnect because um, what I understood as, as home and place was um, my great grandmother's house in Oberlin, my grandfather's house down the street from my home in Lake Charles, like, you know, and that's really the only places I was kind of allowed to, um, to move around and to frequent. So um, I understand like home and, and this idea of play or like the like hometown or like that whole kind of understanding of where my roots as being planted in many different areas of Louisiana. And so that's really influenced not only my like identity, the way I speak, my look, but also, you know, the way that I like essentially, essentially Louisiana, how I perform blackness, um, how I perform gender. That's a really big thing um, for me. And also um, it's influenced my work in, in, in the way that I, I've had a lot of, or I found a lot of difficulty with trying to explain 
that experience. If you're not, if you didn't grow up in like a nomadic, but kind of like rural yet urban or like, you know, slowly increasingly more urbanized place, it's really hard to talk about Southern blackness. You know, like people would oftentimes say things like, um, what do you understand as the South? And for me, I oftentimes thought other, you know, in the deep South, I thought like places like, um, you know, if, if you weren't in Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi, sometimes the Carolinas, depending on how, who I was talking to, you know, Texas is always a debate because we, a lot of people feel like it's really Mexico. You know, um, I didn't really understand you as a Southerner. And even though, you know, now like understanding more of the context of like the history and, and the way colonization really happened in America, I understand, you know, that's also sub subjective, but even more specifically in the state of Louisiana, I understood like growing up where I grew up very different from everywhere else. Um, and it was that like not being not being able to translate that experience and connect to people because really at the root of it is um, this inability or this la lack of desire or this lack of push to really find nuance in Black American experience. So people reject all of these ways that, you know, Blackness is performed and like, you know, all the ways that we like exist. So um, my work is really trying to excavate that, particularly around spirituality, particularly around like gender identity and, and femme identity, which is for me and where I'm from, the crux of everything. Like femininity really, really kind of like guides all things. And it is like an energy that, you know, I, I very much worship and honor and like, you know, embody in myself. Thank you, Leela. Adam, did you have anything that you wanted to address as well around how place has informed your your practice? Yeah, and I'll, I'll I'll be quick. Um, so I was I was brought up in um, what was once known as the wickedest city in America, Phoenix City, Alabama, and it was run by this all white crime syndicate. Uh, there was all kinds of really terrible things that happened there, um, and so as a native son of this place. Uh, where sort of white supremacy was like at the forefront, like these, these criminals got away with everything um, because they owned everybody. Um, and, um, you know, I'm just, I'm grappling with that as a native son of this place. Like, what does it mean to, to have a legacy like this? Um, and also growing up there, my relationship and understanding of truth um, was really influenced by, um, the hushed myths of a place that um, was really run by organized crime for years. Um, and then everything, we swept everything under the rug. They won an all America city award in 1956, I think. And then, and then no one talks about it anymore. And, and in a way, Phoenix city is like this microcosm of American history. It's a contemporary overlap with like the political corruption that we've all been experiencing. <laughs> um, it just uh, over and over again, the more I look at my own history and how it's tied to this little tiny place on the eastern border of Alabama, it, it ties into everything that's going on in the world right now. And then for me, it ties into my own future because it's, you know, documentary filmmaking for a long time was pointing the camera at anything that I could except myself. And the project that I'm working on now centers around this town and it's holding a mirror up so I can actually see myself. So um, that's, yeah, in a nutshell. Well, I'm glad you touched on this issue of inheritance because um, what we take from, you know, what we take on from our ancestors really informs the art that we create. And Leela, I'd love for you to talk a little bit more about this because you really, um, I feel like when you talk about your practice, you really foreground what you inherited, um, the you know, oral mythologies, the, um, the rituals of hair maintenance that you inherited from, from your family and from the community. Do you wanna talk a little bit more about um, you know, these communities that we come from and how that influences your art and your practice? Mm -hmm. um... Well, I think like really, you know, the tricky thing about it is um, I feel like oftentimes when people are kind of like inquiring about um, my personal experience or just like the experience of someone 
from um, Louisiana or specifically when they are of like black and queer experience, like those intersections, um, it's hard to give an answer because it's so nuanced. Like if you have a, if you if you ask the same question um, or just ask the same question of like, um, how did you become who you were to like my sister? She would have a very different, um, you know, uh, a, a very different answer. And it has a lot to do with, um, I think this is, Louisiana just makes this so evident. Um, the kind of like uh, the overarching like kind of racist framework that's kind of always sitting there that like defines everything we do. So, um, you know, even like being assigned male at birth and the first, you know, two to three years of my life, um, you know, having messages from very particular members of my family reinforcing this is how this person will be, this is what we expect, you know, these are the expectations, but also having a lived experience from the, from that age of like me interacting with only very particular people in my family, like a lot of women in my family. And that had both to do with um, the way the women in my family were domesticated, but also a lot of it had to do with displacement and like literally not having um, kind of like the governmental support to work and child rear and do all these things. And um, so, you know, for me, it's like oftentimes, I'm trying to understand at what point did my identity start? And not just from a personal place, but like at what point did I start to understand myself like um, foundationally as like a black person, um, like as someone of feminine identity, as someone like how important like hair was to me because, you know, for a long time, I just grew up being taught certain things and to wear my hair a certain type of way and to speak a certain way. Um, and, you know, when, what was it around like 2005, maybe a few months before Katrina, um, my family, where my mom and my sister and I moved to um, Atlanta. And that was like the first time I really was like deeply challenged by my identity because no one had ever asked me if I was a black person. No one had ever asked me, you know, like what I was mixed with. No one had ever asked me, um, you know, like why I sounded the way I sounded or anything like that. You know, um, although my voice has now been deeply institutionalized, um, I will say that like my identity is always changing. Um, and so how I'm understanding those things that I learned as a child is always changing. Like they, I find myself, um, like memory plays such a large role. Like I'm remembering things that were taught to me at an early age and in some cases I forget. And then being in certain situations where um, I'm encountering that racist framework again, um, it comes, it finds itself like I'm remembering those things like, oh, you know, you're in this art space, make sure your hair is straight that day. Like don't, there should be no curl, no kink, you know? Um, and, uh, and I say this in the essay, you know, the women in my family really taught me how to survive. And they also taught me, you know, what to do, you know, if I needed to die or if like, I mean, that's a very morbid way of looking at it, but you know, they understood um, that inherently that we were never safe. And so a lot of what we were learning was also like, how to navigate that. Like every time you move as a marginalized being, especially one that at such an intersection of so many different like histories um, and different frameworks, um, you will have to be everything simultaneously. And how do you find pride in your blackness? How do you find pride in who you are and your roots? Um, and for me, it's a game of remembering really on the spot. I don't know if that answers your question. That was kind of everywhere, but. <laughs> <laughs> That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Um, anyone want to add anything else to some of to some of what Lita was saying or these issues of inheritance? I just want to say this is a rare opportunity that I have to be in a conversation with Southerners from various parts of the South, and. Um, my partner is from Birmingham, Alabama. And one of the things that I often taught him is, you know, when I went to Spelman undergrad, um, I was confronted with all of these DC, you know, men and women coming to the Atlanta University Center who use the word Bama as a pejorative, like this Bama over here. And even the Tom Joyner, you know, morning show would have the Bama of the week which was like, this is the fool of the week. And it was a cross racialized because they could be talking about a white person, you know, this is the bam of the week. And so I have remembering, I remember being very, like, how are you gonna come to Atlanta? You in the South, you came, you came to the womb of the nation 
and you're denigrating the South as a backwards place when you came here for your educational experience and you are denigrating your grandmothers. And so now I, I like to ask people, is Angela Davis a Bama? Is Sun Ra a Bama? Is Rosa Parks a Bama? Is Zora Neale Hurston a Bama, who was also born in Alabama? You know, like, let's talk about it. I'm oh, sorry. Go for it, Monique. Go. I was just going to say that I feel like the South um, gets overlooked and taken advantage of in so many different kinds of ways. Um, and I feel like, you know, the more I think about the, the Civil War and Reconstruction and then where we are to today, it's like, oh, we're still in reconstruction <laughs> like we never came out of that um it like it started and then it stopped and then we've just been in this like wackadoodle world ever since going round and round and so i mean i think that that we have so much um and also when we think about our natural resources here you know the south is rich um in so many ways and um I just feel like, you know, because we're stuck in this like whirlwind um, until we like, and I say this in my essay, like we need truth and reconciliation and how, and I don't know if we'll ever get there, but like, you know, we can find it through sharing stories and opening up perspectives for people to see and understand the complexities and maybe it doesn't all make sense, you know, but, but at least if you can like have a window um, you can have a little bit of a reference and then there can be understanding um, that is truth that isn't, you know, made for TV, <laughs> but made for TV. <laughs> I'm so glad you said that, Monique. I, I think um, there's a lot around the narrative of the South and who has told that narrative and who has shaped that narrative for years, which, which, um, I think dovetails, dovetails really nicely with something that Leela, you wrote in your essay. I'm gonna quote here. Um, you talk about archives and you say, archives are continuous living works of our own making that exist but beyond the necessity of white access. It is in the archive that artists must ask themselves critical questions regarding power and representation. I'm gonna drop that here so that people can read that. I think that's just so beautifully stated. And I, I'd love to hear you all talk a little bit about what you see as the role of the archive in preserving um, or even shaping and reflecting Southern identity. Yeah, I, I think for me, um... I think really the trick is for, for Southern artists is to be able to identify archive and the, the power of it. So I feel like, um, and I say this in my essay, like, you know, and honestly, Adam is kind of like getting at this point as well with, you know, with his experience, you know, kind of meeting this Southerner in the context of New York at this like networking event, you know? Um, it's like, we have to understand that our culture is like valid. And it's, I mean, maybe we, maybe we understand that, but I think when it starts to intersect with professionalism, um, there sometimes can be these messages, not always coming from us, but sometimes from us, um, that reinforces this idea that like, you know, um, there's not really culture here. And I find people like trying to align themselves with like indigenous or like the way um, the world perceives indigenous nature. Um, there's a, a beautiful book called Braiding Sweetgrass by um, um, a First Nation art, um, writer and ecologist um, named Robin Kimmerer. And she kind of defines like, um, she, she defines indigenous to base, as basically like when a person decides um, that they care about the generation that will be there beyond them. Like when um, they care enough to start to plant seeds, to, to take you know, um, that place um, or like to honor that place and to, to begin to like pour things into it. And I feel like a lot of artists, um, especially like emerging filmmakers and you know, what is that word even really, but 
um, and, and, and emerging visual artists, it's like this idea of like them not paying attention to the work on the walls, you know, um, you know, like the the ice, like the the ice cup lady, and the things that she's saying to you, and the way that you're exchanging and trade and like culture culture sharing, um, those are all things that are worth archiving, and um, that we have so much of it here in the South, especially. Like we're like obsessed with hoarding all of our like you know material things. It's also partially because a lot of us don't really leave, so we just have these long, and that has a lot to do with other things that are economic, you know. But um, because of that, it's like when we recognize that um, that our culture is so important and that it it it, it really is kind of like um, the bones of our country as we know it, um, then we start to take those things more seriously and we start to do things like you know go home and speak to our grandmother that you know calls us all the time but annoys us. You know you you start to understand that there's a lot of power and beauty in that and. When you do those things, I think it informs your work because you start you stop trying to make your stories and storytell from this place that's digestible. You start to embrace your nuance. You start to lean into that. You start to think about who is the person in my family that is not being seen. And that influences your archive. And I feel like um, truth be told, that's the only reason why the South has some, you know, level of like, um, of like, uh, like, what's the word? Like, there's this, this kind of like Phoenix-like quality that like, even if there are messages that happen about the South, something is going to be there, whether it's tangible or a person or somebody's great, great grandmother, who's fortunately still alive, you know, because we have a lot of that in the South, who can tell the story. Um, and I think it's up to like, you know, uh, different kind of gatekeeping people, like people who have gatekeeping positions, different festivals. I mean, very similar, you know, Southern Summit, y'all are doing such a good job with, you know, with what's happening here. It's like, um, we have to embrace that nuance and we have to create space for it to just be that, not to try to contextualize how people archive or how people talk about their experience, but to literally like do the research and the work by listening a lot listening, listening, listening. And, um, you know, I'm talking so much, I'm going to wrap this up, but just listening a lot and giving people this space to um, tell their stories the way that they know how to tell it. And it doesn't always have to look like a film. It doesn't always have to look like a sculpture. It doesn't always have to be a photograph. That it, it sometimes is just the, the oral tradition itself. It's just, it's just the slang. Thank you for saying all that. And thanks to everyone for um, highlighting the true work of the ice cup lady who does not get the shine that she deserves outside of, you know, small, small spaces. Um, Monique, I wonder if you want to talk a little bit about um, My Louisiana Love as, as something of an archive. Um, I don't know if you see it that way or if you ever approached it that way in making it, but um, we'd love to hear your thoughts about archiving stories and what your approach to your work is. Yeah, well, two things. I just, um, when Adam uh, mentioned you're turning the camera on yourself, I'm like, be careful. Um, it happened to me and I, I didn't, I, I, I went like with a lot of resistance uh, with my collaborators, but yeah, my Louisiana love came out in 2012. Um, and it kind of puts a parentheses around the last hundred years uh, in South Louisiana and from a multi-generational perspective with my whole my grandmother, my father and cousins um, who live in the Yakni Shido and Terrebonne Lafouche Parish um, and here in St. Bernard as well. So yeah, I mean, I really do look at it as like, I wanted, I wanted to create a record that could be referenced for the generations, um, you know, my younger cousins who are in the film as children who are now having their own children. Um, but, you know, it's, we didn't just end up here. I wanted them to have a reference with the elders who are now gone for them to be able to tell their stories that were never told. Um, you know, and I think I was a young person at 18 years old trying to make sense of like how we got here and learning about coastal land loss and knowing the stories of my grandmother saying that their land was taken away by oil and gas but 
trying to make sense of it. And so, you know, it's one of those things with all projects where it's like, oh, we didn't do X and Y and Z. And, you know, we had to like pare it down to this really simple 60 minute story. And so much doesn't get included in that story, but at least it's something, you know, it's like a little bit of a, of a fingerprint that is imperfect, but, um, but also has recorded, um, something that's really important to reference into the future. So I'm I'm grateful that we did that work, even though I like had to let people into my personal diary, which wasn't something I really wanted to do, but it was worth the sacrifice. And, you know, it's as my grandmother would say, when the film would end, she'd be like, that's for real. You know, so, um, that was the best compliment ever. <laughs> I love that. Um, Michelle, Adam, anything you'd like to to contribute with regard to this notion of archives? Um, I <laughs> Michelle's poking me. This is good. <laughs> um, I um, I think this kind of ties into coming from a a place who you know, like Phoenix City, where I, I, like I said before, truth was was um, elusive, and so you know, you go into these archives and I've spent a lot of times in archives finding out things that were not in books, you know, about this place. People did, people did research and I've got, you know, recordings of phone calls and none of that was in the book that was written. And these things need to be told, you know, these parts of the story need to be told. And so, but there's also this aspect of like, who owns the archive, who's responsible of collecting those things you know there's there's all of these there's all of these ways that information is curated um and it's historically been curated you know by white folks and so it's like where you know it's in terms of ownership too of information and so like it's just odd to go into an archive and the documents that you're looking at are seen as free information but technically they're copyrighted um, so anyway, I also still understand that the archive, the collection that's in the archive is not the complete and full story. Like you also have to go into these places. You have to be there. You have to talk to people. You have to really dig around rather than spending all the time in the archive. That, that's what I'm learning about the place where I'm from and it's complicated and nuanced relationship with, with truth. Thank you. Well, we are um, closing in on time here. And I know um, some folks have to jet for some one o'clock appointments. But um, I did just want to say thank you to the four of you for taking to making time for this conversation and for sharing your insights and words through the essays. Um, truly, please find time to go and read these works. They are beautiful spend the time that um you know they they just give the time to them that they deserve because they're just beautiful pieces of work and i can't thank the four of you enough for taking part in south summit hey everybody i i just want to say again um to have the four of you in a room together is such an honor it is such an honor and um I'm a fan of all of your work. Like Michelle said earlier, it's rare that we have people together to have conversations like these about Southern identity. And I just, there's there's something there that um, it's, it's great to be able to host this conversation. So thank you. We're now gonna transition into breakout rooms so we can have this conversation um, as a group. And the two questions that uh, I'd really like for everyone to explore with whoever their moderator is in their breakout group is, uh, the first one is coming from Leila's essay, from where and when do you enter? What do you bring with you from your experiences in this region to your various identity points, to your role as a storyteller and or arts administrator? And how does it serve you and your work? And we're gonna, we're gonna paste these questions into the chat in those rooms as well. The second question is what might be needed to move towards a place where Southern filmmakers might see or situate themselves among a lineage of potent and successful storytellers. We are all coming back. Thank y'all so much for sharing. I know we had a really, uh, really fulfilling conversation. 
and we mostly answered the questions. We also kind of just talked about our families and movement and legacy. Uh, so I will um, go ahead and get things going. Um, Fallon, would you like to start by sharing some takeaways from your group briefly? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so with the first question about from where and when we enter, um, there were a lot of different entry points um, from amongst our group. Some of them were kind of identity points and others were, were cultural as, as Southerners. So we talked a little bit about, um, similar to yesterday's breakout conversation, actually this sort of slow pace of life in the South that informs the creation of the work um, and how that brings in more patience and a less of aggressive approach to the creative process and the collaborative process. Um, we also talked about this sort of bridges that um, lots of us were building within our work to reconcile or integrate or assimilate various identity points and how rich that is in terms of sparking uh, departure points in storytelling. So, um, and how it helps, you know, to have these experiences of living in various parts of the South or having lineages in various parts of the South helps to kind of um, explore the different places of overlap. So um, one person in our group talked about the similarities between Mex Mexican culture and Cajun culture and Creole culture and the culture of indigenous people and the many places of overlap. Um, and then we talked also about making time, um, you know, in our creative practices to talk to elders and that reinforce our connection of home um, into our roots. And in terms of what might be needed to move to a place where Southern filmmakers might be able to see or situate themselves among a lineage of potent and successful storytellers. Um, we talked a little bit about the internal shifts that are needed in just validating our own work as Southerners and seeing our own work as valuable in these spaces. Um, we talked about how exciting it is that there isn't actually a canon for Southern film. So there's an opportunity to make one, that there's this feeling of being on the precipice of um, you know, a growing field, growing and more connected field and the sort of um, rich sense of opportunity there. Um, we talked again about this connection to the ancestral realm and when become, people become more interested in their own lineages and they can do their own digging into the, the traumas or patterns or um, positive things that may have been uh, passed down from the ancestors that can make for a very successful story because it's personal and others can empathize. We talked a little bit about needing space for um, regionally to create our own standards that are outside of Hollywood standards in terms of production levels or aesthetic pressures that may not be right for Southern work. So it called back, I think, to some of yesterday's conversations around reframing success. Um, we are also, you know, recognizing that there's a, a little bit of an education gap around um, Southern filmmakers um, needing, you know, a, a sort of connection to knowing what's out there in terms of other Southern work and also um, connective tissue between identity points and shared experiences and this sort of deep desire to see our stories and experiences represented. Um, and we also talked a little bit about having a charge to educate and inform communities as creatives in the South um, to spread the word to people who aren't in these circles and spaces to have a more robust understanding of what the South is and uh, a desire to have more collaborative or interactive spaces. So less isolation in the space of making our work. Y'all hit a lot of points in that short time. That's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible takeaways. Uh, well, I'll pass it along to Clint to share briefly. Oof, I hate to follow that. Um, we got to know each other uh, and I, we didn't quite get to as many points as Fallon's group, but our conversation kind of focused in on language, um, uh, particularly how uh, the languages that surround us as we're growing up inform, inform us and how we use that to inform our work. 
Um, Leela actually was in our group and um, talked a bit about how for folks who have been othered in some way, language can be the most powerful tool, uh, which is a really powerful way of looking at it. Um, yeah, I think we had, you know, some perspectives of carrying multiple uh, languages and multiple um, uh, perspectives on the world and feeling a bit like more of a melting pot that we can take into our writing and injecting our own stories into the work that we're creating. Um, yeah, I think some of also what you touched on Fallon, we, we addressed, but pass it on to the next, next group. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, Megan, I'll pass it along to you. Thanks, Zanda uh, We had a really, really interesting discussion overall um, for the first question of, you know, where and when do you enter and what do you bring with you? There was a lot of talk about um, listening, especially if you're reintegrating into the South. Uh, maybe you were born here, grew up elsewhere, came back other places and, and really listening to friends, family, peers, um, and how then, how do you consider more of what we hear? You know, example of like, you know, not leaving, staying. Um, there was as similar to in Clint's group, a lot of discussion of, of family and history and, and really how much that influences everybody and what we bring to the table on a daily basis was really important. Um, and then also, you know, just how do you reintegrate yourself into the South if you have been gone for a long time? Uh, perhaps your family is in the South, but you've been gone for so many years and you come back and you're trying to reconnect with family or friends, but at the same time, you know, the history that comes with those family and friends, you're also cha challenging the historical narrative that they are so steeped in that you've had more time away from and can see from an outside lens and address. How do you make, make that reintegration possible? Um, and, you know, how do you, even if you did grow up in the South, maybe you started to identify yourself as a Southerner later. Maybe you didn't identify as Southern early on and it was only later, maybe you moved to another area, say from Memphis to Atlanta, as, <laughs> as one of our um, group members had. And, and you know, coming to that aspect of your identity later and, and how, do you, how do you define that? Um, and how to emphasize the totality of Southern artistic expression that recognizes voices that maybe you didn't grow up with and also that you shouldn't or cannot speak for but how do you recognize them and give them voice in your work was really important. Um, I think that you know the final point for that question that really I think resonated was trying to situate what it means to be black plus all of the other identities that one may have with that, um, author, scholar, you know, the list can go on and on and on when everything that you're feeling initially says that, you know, that Southern identity is a lost cause. It's an identity of oppression. How do you find pride in that and maybe translate that into a history of survival and thriving? And so that, that came up. Came up. Um, for the second question, which sort of naturally segued into on what might be needed to move toward, more toward a place of um, situating ourselves is this idea of excavating history of a restorative, or healing cartography as a way of grounding ourselves, you know, rethinking the map culturally, socially, geographically. Um, and also that we just really need to start with the history. You know, a lot of people don't know the history of that the history of Black Hollywood originates in the South, specifically Virginia and the Carolinas. And we need to, you know, raise that history up more and make it part of, as Fallon mentioned, the fact that we can identify a new canon now for the South and, and you know, putting that history in there. Um, you know, the way that we tell stories, uh, the example of hip hop was brought up, very much uses Southern African-American storytelling techniques. We just don't see enough of it out there to promote it widely and we need to recognize that more. Um, looking at the 
folk tellers and stories that came before us and acknowledging when they came from the South, which is not often done and spreading those histories and knowledge far and wide. And then also just getting really granular and creating a large body of work um, to create that space to be, you know, create that lineage of potent storytellers. Just, you know, what are all the different Southern identities? Just really get down to it on a microscopic level and then really promote that widely through a large body of work. Um, and I could go on for hours, but I'm not going to. <laughs> Yeah, there's uh, honestly the the things that you all have said in these groups um, is it feels like the basis of a really strong curriculum, you know, a really important curriculum that needs to happen of just southernness. Um, I'll pass it over to Kyoko. Thanks, Senator Shea. Um, all right. Well, our discussion centered around an idea that Melissa Bizani Bizani brought up, which is, you know, what is the difference in like having kinship ties, people that you um, feel a strong connection to in your relationship to the land and place through your, your sort of lived experiences um, versus blood quantum and the idea that this is a colonizing mechanism. And so um, that really kicked off an interesting discussion about how we can be, a, you know, obviously multiple things, but also how that can also be in kind of in contradiction with one another or conflict at times. And um, so um, Raul, who's from uh, Mexico, talked about, you know, learning about Chicano movement and, and uh, which prioritizes Indian culture over the colonizing culture. And so um, um, thinking about that in terms of, um, you know, growing up culturally in, as sort of colonized, but, um, also looking more inwardly into his uh, indigenous roots. Um, Cameron uh, talked about growing up and having a long lineage of living in Louisiana, a family that's in Louisiana, but as a queer and trans person creating her own family and, and talking about transcestors um, who are guiding her in, from beyond the grave and beyond blood. I just thought that was such a beautiful idea and image. Um, and so having two families um, it, that emerge from this impossible reality and other from a long lineage of family. Um, yeah, so a lot of our discussion was around that and also being from multiple places, Nicole, whose family is from Louisiana, but um, being growing up in, in Los Angeles, with African-Americans who came from Louisiana, who were Catholic um, and confronting this idea that racism only exists in the South, but that it's everywhere. And so oftentimes people are holding up a mirror to the wrong place, wrong places. Uh, and then as far as the second question goes, we talked a lot about just having spaces like this is really you know, we need more spaces like this and the spirit and energy of collaboration that uh, really expresses the full diversity of the South um, and also the importance of oral storytelling, uh, which is so much a Southern thing. Um, and also rejecting and not needing the sort of institutional approval of what a Southern storyteller is. Um, and the importance of making new friends and family and relationships through conversation and collaboration. Beautiful, thank you. And Zaf, I'll pass to you. Thank you. Um, we were a very small group and we just started with getting to know each other a little bit. Um, and we uh, moved on to discussing about Southern identity to the first question. Um, we all shared about like everyone shared kind of their own uh, growing up story that was really nice. And um, we kind of talked about how there's so many different ways to perceive what Southerner means. And it's so beautiful to be in this group and like the summit today uh, to get uh, different stories of backgrounds of different people and kind of um, 
mirroring that. Um, and there was a nice uh, remark about this idea of insulation, how like the thinking of the Gulf as the womb of the world and the connection between the global South and the American South and how that is very clear um, to uh, one of our group members. And, um, and also wanting to understand more and finding community uh, more in the global South, a very unique place to be. Um, another uh, thing was how like sometimes being a sudden storyteller and like also a sudden identifying uh, person, um, how like the pressure and overdetermination of containing the stories within the South sometimes and like, um, sorry, uh, I'm losing my notes <laughs> or this. Uh, and um, the notion of stories always having to compete with space. Um, for the second question, we discussed, uh, we discussed how larger organizations uh, traditionally historically from New York and LA always discovered uh, Southern writers, Southern artists, and like uh, whether it's a publishing company or a film studio and um, publish them and that the lack, the lack of like stronger organizations, um, whether it's a film company or a publishing company that would support and uh, distribute and um, the work of certain artists uh, is kind of in, important and lacking and how um, we got to shout out how like organizations like NRFS have been um, doing a lot of work around that too um, in, the, in the past like years uh, stressing the importance of uh, displaying work from certain artists and um, supporting them and helping them to um, reach wider audiences. Uh, and also the challenge of like um, the certain organizations um, exhibiting certain work or supporting certain work kind of staying within the South and not always going wider than that. And the uh, uh, importance of also having robust distribution where we can uh, share these stories and share this work with the rest of the country and also um, the world. Um, I think that kind of wraps it up. Thank you all. I'll, I'll keep it short because there's a lot of overlap with what you said and what my group talked about. But um, to lump it all together, we, we talked about this search for a commonality um, for a lot of Southerners in, in different places that we go looking for how that reflects what home looks like for us. We talked about um, pulling stories from our own histories rather than outside of ourselves and looking at other places and um, how in terms of, you know, how can Southern filmmakers situate themselves among, among this lineage of um, potency and successful storytellers. Uh, we think that in order for filmmakers and storytellers in general to be interested in preservation, the institution and the leaders of the places that we occupy need to be interested in that same preservation as well, um, the preservation of our land, you know, and that capitalism, gentrification and displacement inhibit us from shaping our legacies. And that's displacement of people, displacement of culture. Um, we also talked about the reverse great migration and how it's sort of transforming artistry as people reground themselves in their Southern roots. And I wanted to mention briefly, I don't know if Michelle is still in here um, because I, I think in all of the groups, we did a lot of sharing of family history. She wrote this beautiful article in Southern cultures called Rooted Black Women, Southern Memory and Womanist Cartographies. And we um, talked a little bit about, you know, mapping the spaces that have been important to us and our lineage and our families. Uh, so yeah.